Hi all. I hope everyone is very well. Uh, starting this one early, so, uh, cause got work today, uh, didn't yesterday, snowed slightly. Um, I've been contracted to, uh, <laughs> put on, put on an, a new roof and, um, you know, I live south of one of the Great Lakes, so, uh, th it's always an interesting time to do something like that, um, uh, cause you have a lot of other things to figure on than you do at other times of the year, but, uh, it'll be all right. So, um, I've got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of various information and I uh, hope you guys will bear with me. Um, what I had to do at the stopping point of the last, uh, exodus under a microscope, I knew that in order to stay as myopic and detailed as we were going to stay, uh, I still had to pull back and look at some big picture details too. And there's some things that I've realized in having to do that. And I'm going to reveal those things to you. But one of the things that I've had to come to terms with is that you know if in fact I've been completely wrong and um, this did occur you know in the Middle East uh, Egypt and Palestine the one thing I have to do is stay absolutely honest um, and prove that and show that um, as soon as you, if you're uh, if you're researching and if you're doing something uh, like I'm doing, which is trying to figure out what it was that the the Bible initially said, you know, for people who would have let's say lived back. Um, in Yisrael when when it was actually a nation and how they would uh, have understood the scriptures how they would have understood uh, um, the geography and really how they would understand uh, uh, the means of communication I you know I think communication basic I, I do um, and there are uh, people out there who are in a sense they're language philosophers where part of what their job is besides uh, various linguistic specifics is to to try to at least um to try to help us understand better what language does you know its purpose and then what it does cuz language is really powerful you know uh, if uh, Aliim spoke and things just were, if no word will go unaccounted for, be forgotten about, no idle word. Language is a powerful and important thing, um, and everyone has been hurt by language. And everyone has been encouraged by language. Uh, it is expression, and it can take a lot of forms. And I know that depending on the language, it can change your mindset. It, somebody with a certain kind of language that works in a certain kind of way that has uh, a certain lexicon, specific particular lexicon to it. Um, these people can think in a way that is different than somebody with a very uh, distinctly different language. So a lot of things have to be taken into consideration concerning uh, language. And there have been a few times now, as I've been going along, that I've thought to myself, I guess if I put aside some of these details that nearly make the Middle East as a location uh, of the Bible impossible. 
and there are those details. That's the whole reason I'm still doing this. If I were to put those aside and focus on some of the details that make it seem more likely, um, I, I could easily settle for the Mideast as a location, you know. Um, the problem is, you know, I could work at this for years. You know, uh, the, just say the idea that, that biblical events happened in another location. I could work at that for years. I could stake my whole reputation on it, you know, that, that I would have gleaned in that time. Um, I could have um, amassed uh, quite a number of, of generous patrons who really believed, you know, in what I was doing. And that was probably their, their, their greatest point of interest was that maybe more than than the language portion of the studies or anything else and if i found out in fact that i was wrong and it was in the middle east um i would have to be 100 percent honest about that because that's the only way to be it's it's the only way to live and you know i, I think especially in this area of study biblical study it's the only way you're going to get anywhere. And if that means hitting a lot of brick walls, um, because you're, you're staying as true to the material as possible, and I've hit tons of those brick walls, then that's what you have to do. That's what I have to do. Um, so, in broadening this a little bit, I had to take a look first off at defined borders. So there's a number of passages um, in which Yahweh defines borders for Yisrael. These are the borders, and the reason he defines them for them, because he's already defined them uh, before this for their, their fathers, for um, Abram, before he was Abram, uh, Yitzhak, Jacob. He repeats this, of course, um, through Masha to Yisrael uh, in the Midbar, which is either translated wilderness or or desert. But uh, there's no proof that we're talking about a desert. Anyways, uh, so I wanted to look at I wanted to look at a few things boundary wise, and what's our likelihoods. And I'll tell you something, I say this a lot, I will continue saying this until I understand why these things exist. The peculiarities to this language, its syntax, and expressions that are translated in a different way than what I'm seeing in the Obri. And I don't always understand exactly what the Obri is saying because sometimes uh, sometimes, sometimes it's worded in ways that first off definitely um, contrast, uh, oppose what Masoretic rules would be. But the more you understand about Masoretic rules, the more you understand that their their rules are as <sighs> unconcrete as English language rules. English language rules are oftentimes ridiculous. And it, it, it is the inconsistency to English and its rules that make it a difficult language to learn. It's not necessarily the form um, or, or necessarily the syntax that we use though sometimes that catches people a little bit. But oftentimes it's a fact that there's not a consistency of rules. It works that same way in Masoretic. Now, anybody who believes that the Bible is the word of the only, um, al-olion, which would be, I hate the word God, because God is just G-D, like the, the Jews print it, which is Gad, a Babylonian, or Babel, Babylon deity. So I don't like saying that. al uh, al al most high. How about that? I really don't think his language that he created 
I think that he used in creation. Uh, I think that he used from the start and survived all the way down the line. Um, because, you know, uh, between uh, all he created and then the the eight that were preserved in that particular flood and then uh, the three families spawned from that and all of their descendants, there was uh, a certain family that, that retained a particular language. You know, there is the the instance of uh, the Tower of Babel and, and that um, confusion. Um, and and that, that chapter's odd, too, and it's not translated very well either. But somehow or another, we've got this uh, character, Ober, the father of Pelag and Yachten, um, and he wasn't too many generations off from Abram. He's got this language, preserved language, all the way through to Abram, and then from Abram, preserved, all the way through up in, into books that we see being written very late stage, like Ozra or Ezra, and Nehemiah or Nehemiah, um, Zachariah or Zechariah. It's still preserved. Still the same. Some people will say, well, it's uh, changed slightly. Um, if at all, if at all, perhaps some of the, the verbiage or terminology, but I've looked in those later books and they don't use specifically odd terminology as when, when you would compare it to, say, terminology that you might see being used by Yeshua or Isaiah. Um, Ayub or Job, um, Yazkel or Ezekiel. And it could just be that they had a greater vocabulary and understanding of the language. Although in the portions of their books where it says, you know, the word of Yahweh came to me and said this, they all have that consistency of voice. Well, I just believe that that language, if it had been preserved for that long, and there's every sign that it has been, that it would not be um, the type of confusion of language that we see with Masoretic Hebrew or English, at least English since 1611, of course. Um, and there's something to be said about English before then, because English was very different before then. So using all I can that I understand about Aubrey, and going over some border terms, promises, and then investigating certain specifics about that border. What happened was uh, I ended up seeing a lot of things that I, I wasn't expecting that I would see. And so I have to, I have to comment on a few different things that um, they're, they're not really wild or all over the place. In fact, I believe that all of these things are going to uh, just serve to get us further down the road. Um, but maybe what I should do is start with the yar. Um, start with the yar and zone, or zone. Um, sometimes that uh, ts sound, which they call the tzadi, at the beginning of the word, um, I do often wonder if it's said smoothly enough to where it could be considered a z, a z sound at the beginning of the word and possibly either just a straight TS sound, as in like rats um, or oats, or if, um, if it's more of an X sound, oaks, rocks, or um, if sometimes at the end it takes on a Z, which I just don't think it does. Opinion. But we are going to look at those two things, and there's, there's a reason for it. It's a real good one, too. Um, now, the first, I'm going to get up on on the screen here and make sure what I've got. I've got Nizal. I don't really need that up on the screen. 
I'm going to get ER and I'm going to get zone up here on the screen real quick. I'm going to start you out with one thing before we go straight to zone. And that is the word <coughs> tsoe. Um, it's the uh, so-called sadi or tsa o e and it is actually used and you cannot pay attention to when they say something might be a verb or a masculine noun a feminine noun an adjective um, it doesn't hurt to check those things if you're checking a word however um, I have found more times than I can count anymore uh, how that has not been correct it does not work um, in syntax things they say are nouns are actually working as verbs and vice versa. However, the um, the tsa and the o, especially the tsa, you'll see it in a lot of words um, that have um, an action to them. You know, like um, tsan with uh, a, a herd, um, or is it? Um, well, you'll see it at the end of something like. Um, rots to to run or in words like uh, uh, swarms uh, swarms in the air or or teeming swarms in the water um, shirats you'll oftentimes find it in those words um, but here we got uh, the tsa and o and and the way it's used is they they'll translate it as exile traveling wander <clears throat> I think wander works very well um, syntactically. So if you consider that with with soa, and and if I go forward here to um, sixty eight fifteen, <clears throat> excuse me, I do have a sinus infection, so <sighs> that's what you get for being outside this time of year, especially when you're doing things and getting wet and all that. Um, okay. My bad. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Alright, so it's on, the first time you see it actually is in uh, Numbers 1332 when they come to Habarun. Um, and it says, um, now Habarun uh, was built seven years before Tzon, uh in Mitzrim. Um, and the next time you see it is the most telling passage. Marvelous things did he, speaking of Yahweh, in the sight of their fathers. And I have the passage up here too, 78.12. I'll have to go back a little bit, sorry. It's talking about how um, the Yisraeli uh, Israelites were, were not giving any glory to, to Yahweh. Um, they kept not, <clears throat> starting in 78.10, they kept not the covenant of Aliyim and refused to walk in his law and forget his works, his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Mitzrim, in the field of Tzon or Shade Tzon. So, um, Shade, I, I have speculated many times, Shade is uh, not the wild land like Midbar, but Shade would actually be more like the, um, how do I say it, the uh, the tame land. Uh, not necessarily a field as in farmers planting uh, a field. So, um, I think that's, that's probably one of the best uh, definitions of uh, Shade. So, if you figure... And then it goes on, you know, he divided the, the sea, caused, caused them to pass through. So he's doing all of these mighty, wonderful works. Where? In Shade Tzon. You see, we're not given the name of uh, this capital where Poroa is, where, where Yusuf was staying when um, his brothers came down to buy grain and, and he shipped his, his father and, and brothers and all their family uh, down to him. But we do see here that he did these marvelous works in Shade Tzon. Um, and then <clears throat> Tzon has a number of passages after that. Um, it, it's repeated in 7843 how he, he wrought his signs in Mitzram, his wonders in the Shade Zone. Again, it's going to say that in 7843. And there's a few other verses that are really interesting, like the, um, 
the princes of Tzone are fools, the council of the wise counselors of Peroa has become brutish. How they say unto Peroa, I'm the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings, or uh, Malek Kadem. Kadem, ancient, is used as ancient uh, nearly as much as it's used uh, as east, which I think is, actually it's really telling. Um, and there's a lot of related words to Kadem too that um, would tell you a lot about it. Um, so the princes of Zone are become fools. Again, this is a, a, a repeat. Um, the princes of Nope, now that's another city, are deceived and they have also seduced Mitzrim, uh, another main city. So again, a passage from Isaiah on the princes of Zone as ambassadors. Um, and then a, a promise in Ezekiel, I'll make Pathros desolate, I will set fire in Zone. I'll execute judgments in no. Um, if I remember right, that no is badly translated. That should be na, like in uh, the name of the uh, patriarch who brought his three sons through the flood. Anyway, so we see from that psalm that the most likely candidate for the city of Peroa during the time of the plagues that led up to the exodus would be Zone. Um, I guess if you disagree, you'll, you'll have to show me how that is um, an incorrect assessment. Now, the other thing I have up is a word called yar, and you'll either see it as y-a-r, yar, or y-a-u-r sometimes. Um, and unfortunately, it's usually translated as river. Um, I, I say that's unfortunate because... The yar, uh, first off, besides for yes, besides for two passages, it's mostly um, attributed to Mitzrim. Um, uh, the first time you'll see it is in Peroah's dream that he told Yosef, Joseph, um, where he stood by the yar. Um, you'll see it in early Exodus when Peroah's daughter went to bathe herself um, in the yar. And I think that was ritualistic, and I think that we're going to see why she would ritualistically be bathing herself in the yar. You see, Mitzram had many centuries to become a very advanced society. By the time that Yusuf rose to great prominence there, and he brought in his whole family, um, it would seem to me that Mitzram was definitely a what would you say? I mean, an empire. I don't know if I'd say a world power. Um, even though I believe that there was a worldwide travel at that time, absolutely. For, for trade, yes. So yes, we see it all through um, Exodus. It's one of the types of water that um, Masha's staff touches. It turns into dam or blood. Um, <clears throat> the um, What they translate as frogs. Uh, come out of it and infest the land. Um, and I'm only saying that because animals are one of the hardest things to determine that they're correct about. That's, that's kind of the thing. Um, so anyways, you see this yar in context only with Mitzram all the way up um, uh, through the Exodus. And, um, and then all of a sudden, it, we see nothing uh, concerning it uh, whatsoever until 2 Kings 19.24. And now 2 Kings 19.24 is Yeshua or Isaiah the prophet speaking to, um, um, it, yeah, it'd be Hezekiah or Hezekiah the king. And he's speaking about the Malak or king of Ashur or Syria. And it's, of course, Yahweh speaking, and he's saying that this is kind of the message to that king of Ashur. I've digged and drunk strange waters with the sole of my feet. Have I dried up all the yarim of besieged places? It, <clears throat> so the thing is, I don't think yar is a, just a name of something. So um, types of water, they, they can have names. Like they claim that yarden, um, this sort of bifurcating, um, I, it seems like a river course, because um, it floods its banks in the spring and fall. Yarden, that they translate Jordan, 
they say that Yarden is actually a name. It doesn't describe what it is, except they say it describes what it does, the descender. <clears throat> well, the odd thing about that is all rivers descend. That's the way it works. If they flow, they descend, all of them, uh, bar none, no exceptions. If they don't descend, they're not a river. They're probably a canal. Um, and then we see it in Job 28.10. Now, this passage does not seem to have anything to do with Mitzrim. The interesting thing is the two passages where it seems to have nothing to do with Mitzrim whatsoever, which, by the way, the two kings 1924, that does, because the king of Asher actually had come up against Mitzrim and just decimated Mitzrim at that time. It's Job 28.10. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with Mitzrim. Um, the only thing we can see is, like, he says, he cutteth out Yarim among Tzur. Now, some could say Tzur is the uh, <clears throat> the root or a root, you know, of, of Mitzrim, Mitzur. And you'll see Mitzur uh, in another one of these passages. However, it does certainly seem because of the way that we can trace genealogies in Genesis 10, that Mitzram was not named for the type of land, per se. It was the man's name, one of the sons of Ham. His name was Mitzram. And then he had some children that um, branched out from there. One of the branches from Mitzram turned out to be the um, Katharim, um, who eventually became the Palshathim, which, as I said, that doesn't seem to be a name so much as a descriptive title given or earned by them, Palshathim. Um, but every other time you're going to see Yar or Yarim um, associated with Mitzram, but in like two or three passages. And it is those passages and the fact that it is used in both the singular and the plural makes me think that it is the description of a type of water. And there's all different sorts of types of waterways, is there not? Um, unfortunately, we, we don't, I don't know if we really think of it in the same way that the Obri mind would think of it. But I can tell you based on Leviticus 11, uh, verses 9 through 12, that the basics are Mayem at the top, being waters. You'll find that in Genesis 1. Mayem being waters. And then the, the two subcategories that it's broken into in Leviticus uh, 11, 9, 10, 11, and 12, I think, you'll see it uh, turned into Yamim for seas and Nahalim for rivers. Or let's just say, let's just say streams. Because <clears throat> a stream... I think better uh, denotes what this thing does. A uh, stream is, of course, taking water from one place and it's usually carrying it to another place where it's cycled through the hydrological cycle. A yam uh, is going to be water that's more contained. You can have you can have yam be as big as like yam gadul spoken of um, as one of the borders of the promised land, or you can have it, as odd as it seems, as small as the large basin with the oxen beneath it that uh, Shalmei or Solomon made for the temple. That's even called a yam. But those are the two main categories, subcategories, below Mayim. You have Yamim, or Seas, and Nahalim. So what I think is everything that behaves in the same way as Nahalim, but with a different name, and we can see that it's not a proper name, but it is actually, well, in the same way that we would have rivers, brooks, streams, and so on, that you would have these things. Um, and in English, you could say uh, a river is a stream, a brook is a stream and so on. Well, in that same way, in Obri, and I think in this video I'm going to show you that, we'll see that many of these things, like Nair, and it looks like Er and Yarim, are under that broader category of Nahal, Nahalim. So that's what it looks like Yar is. Now, what makes it Er instead of um, I don't know, Nair? I, I don't know, but I know it's a Yar. Um, 
and this ER is never called um, a nair uh, or a nahal. Now, some people might say, well, what about nahal mitzrim? Because there's a number of um, passages that refer to nahal mitzrim. And I'm going to show you that nahal mitzrim ha actually has to refer to the border. Um, there is a border river called Shehur um, that really denotes uh, the border of, of Mitzram. And that's what we're kind of working towards here. So as for now, this um, AR is what I believe going through their capital city of Tzon. Um, now what's interesting is you could possibly make an you could no you could really make a strong argument <clears throat> for the uh, root of yar being a u r which is light our is light and why would they have light as a root <laughs> to this uh particular type of water well for one thing we see peroa's daughter ritualistically bathing in it and I'm sure she had palaces, um, bathers, baths, whatever she wanted so that she could do that indoors in the privacy of her palace. She's going to this yard to bathe, and I would see that as entirely ritualistic. Now, Masha's mother put him in a type of basket <clears throat> in this yard. Now, did she do that because she wanted him to float away? I don't think so. I think she did that because she knew where Peroa's daughter bathed. She wanted him to be found. There's something to this story that we're not entirely aware of. But one thing I think is very possible about this yar and why its root might actually be light and why Peroa's daughter might be bathing in it and why, for instance, Peroa orders in Exodus 1 that all the male obri children uh, be drown in the yar and why it is the yar that's touched by masha and turned to blood um, as opposed to other and there's plenty of types of waters in mitzram you can see that in uh, those exodus verses there's another verse concerning the yar where yahweh is speaking uh, directly to Peroa, and uh, in English, it's in Ezekiel 29.3, to speak and say, thus says Yahweh Alayim, behold, I am against thee, Peroa, Melech, Mitzrim, or king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his Yarim, which has said, now that's a plural, which has said, my Yar is my own, I've made it for myself. You can look at that translation. It's actually pretty decent the way that the English has worded it. Um, I think it gives us a lot of information about the yar, the way they looked at the yar. Um, and I'm going to tell you this. Now, maybe, maybe you would look at yar and you would think, well, if, if, if the root is light, A-U-R, Maybe it got its name. Maybe it got its name because, because it fanned out like rays of light, like a delta would. Um, I'm giving this directly to the people who think um, that this happened in the, in the Middle East because I'm not going to be dishonest and hold back a possibility. So I'm giving that to you. That's, that's a gimme. You take that. The problem is <clears throat> how many times yar is pluralized. Yarim, yari, and yarim. Okay? Um, so deltas uh, doesn't quite work as well, you see. I think there's a different reason why it might have a, a root of light and why Peroa's daughter might be bathing in it ritualistically, why Peroa might have um, kind of said in his own pride that that he made uh, the Yar and Yarim. Um, I don't know this, but 
it's possible that Yar and Yarim are actually dug canals or a canal system. Um, I'm not putting anything heavy behind that, but there's a possibility that they're actually man-made. Now, I don't know that we're talking about rock bottom sort of man-made stuff. So in certain canals, um, they make them out of stone or they make reservoirs from concrete. Um, most canals, because of how big a project it is, are going to have dirt bottoms. And it's going to be one of the reasons that the people could have dug around the ER when it was turned to blood and still find no clean water around it. So that's my take on it. And the other thing about it, which is why I say it seems like it might be ritualistic, is this. And I'm only playing this. This is really short, and it'll give you an idea of of kind of what I'm thinking with this. The pyramids of the ancient city of Teotihuacan have supplied much of Mexico's knowledge of its pre-Hispanic past. Now, the discovery of a sacred tunnel beneath the pyramid of the feathered serpent, the temple of a civilization which perished over 2,000 years ago, leaving no written records, may revolutionize modern understanding of Mexico's indigenous history. The discovery was made by Sergio Gomez of the Mexican National Institute of Anthropology. He said that over 50,000 relics, ranging from arrowheads to fine crafted jewellery, have emerged from his team's excavations. He hopes that their discoveries will provide clues into the civilization's culture. Marcos Gonzalez, another archaeologist at the site, explains the project's progress. The tunnel we have discovered is 103 meters long. We have excavated the length of it, but we still need to dig down and into three chambers which are at its end. This project has produced an enormous amount of material, and we hope to be able to learn more about our ancestors. Now, you guys have probably heard of things like this. That <clears throat> there are these false rivers they believe dug beneath these high places that they find in Mexico. And why do I call them high places? Well, high places is uh, Bame, B-M-E, Bame, high places. Um, I call them high places because there's nowhere else in the world that I'm aware of that fit the definition of high place like these do. Step pyramids don't, regular pyramids don't, because these, specifically these structures that are still standing for us to witness, they are made with a specific design wherein one could put a temple and or a, a sacrificial um, table uh, atop these. They had very large tops to them. They were built up very, very high. Um, and they were designed specifically to have staircases up to them. These are high places. I've looked all over the world and I've never seen in anywhere in the world like I see in Mexico these high places. Now somebody might say, well why don't we see any in America if any of your theories are correct. First off, uh, I believe that some people have talked about the remains or foundations of things that look like they might have been high places at one point in time in America. That's one thing. The other thing to remember is one of the last kings of Judah before the king of Babel took them away and then when they came back there's no talk about them even trying to rebuild these uh, or high places was uh, called Joash in the English translation um, and he leveled all of them. He leveled all of them. There were none left. So I'm just telling you, if somebody had that question, why don't why wouldn't we see any, you know, in America if your theories are correct, your crazy theories, well that would be one reason. Okay? So this is not the only case either where they've seen um them being oftentimes built over underground streams or where it would seem that an artificial channel was dug underneath them because per they probably had types of beliefs 
um, about the sacredity, <laughs> sacredness, uh, of rivers or channels. If they were dug channels, perhaps, and that would be why Perot would be so um, prideful about, you know, his his making of, of all of his channels or canal systems that maybe he once had. Um, where, you know, you can't really have a canal system unless you have the natural water to begin with to work off of or to pull it from. So, there's that. So, the interesting thing about all of this is that, for one thing, uh, any of you who are aware of the Greater Israel Project knows that they always say that they have to pretty much say like that the Yar is the Nile and that Yahweh promised Israel and they, they say the Jews try to say that they are Israel okay and then they say that Yahweh promised to Abram, Yitzhak, Jacob, and in extension Israel <clears throat> the lands from they would say the Nile to the Euphrates and all you have to do is punch in Greater Israel Project and you'll see this sort of map that they say defines you know their land and then they cut like part way into Saudi Arabia because they say well the wilderness or desert you know up to uh, the Lebanon and so they say that you know well they deserve to get Lebanon too there's some subtle <laughs> There's some subtle and, and some not so subtle problems with all of that, by the way. But um, here's one of the biggest problems with it. And um, I am going to just close these out. And uh, we'll, we'll put up a map. I better put a map on screen, huh? Um, let's just, I'm just going to type in map, map, map of Exodus. I had this up, but I had to close it because it, it's not great to have a million windows open, I suppose, um, in the computer or in the house at this time of year. So everybody's got different ideas about the Exodus. Um, get a good map open. Well, this one's a big map. Jeez. <clears throat> if I click on this and it opens in another window, will it show me a really big image? Yeah, kind of will. Um, however, I need an image that that takes us up to the um, the Euphrates. So I might have to just. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I I might just punch in the Greater Israel Project. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? Sorry, I'll put in Bing Maps. Because right now I don't feel like pausing while I do this. I do everything on the fly pretty much and and as often as I can I pause between doing these things but sometimes even that gets tedious all right and I'll punch in Egypt and so I'll have both of these maps now here and and I'll zoom out a bit and, and I'm gonna pull I'll pull that area right in mid-screen and yeah I can't even okay I can't even fit in my screen what they say. So for the greatest Greater Israel Project, they, they literally will show you this blue that will go from the Nile here, like all the way up the Nile. And, and, and I'll, oftentimes they'll hit like the straight middle of the Nile. Um, and, and, and they'll go all the way over here to the Euphrates. Now the Euphrates, um, its mouth is over here in the Persian Gulf. And, and it winds um, all the way up through I Iraq and, and Syria. And then there's a, kind of a, a, a long, twisty lake there. And then, uh, almost straight north of that in, in Turkey, there are two rivers that converge to create the source of the Euphrates, which is really weird because if the, if the Euphrates is the biblical Parath, um, there should be one nair that splits into four heads and one would be Parath and the other the Hadquil. They're saying the Euphrates and the Tigris are the Parath and the Hadquil. Unfortunately the Euphrates gets its source from two rivers that converge up here in Turkey and the Tigris gets its source uh, from over 50 miles away from a lake uh, up here in eastern Turkey. So that's a little weird, eh? 
but that's where they go to and then they kind of they cut this sort of line that sort of runs northeasterly like right through Saudi Arabia which that probably won't matter all that much since Jews run Saudi Arabia anyway so that that's not going to cause as much trouble as the trouble they're causing in all these other countries and and Egypt you know um to from what they say to to bring you know to fruition this greater Israel project now i don't believe that's their ultimate goal you know is just to gain that land but i think their goal right now is to cause unrest and upset in the middle east because ever since they they've established this um this illegal state uh, of israel and all these settlements um and i'm not saying particularly like the 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 poor or common Jews necessarily have have been about this business okay but the people that ha have established this and are, are controlling it and everything you know they they took control of the Suez Canal right away and I, that's that's a that's a huge uh, a doorway in the sea to control and whoever controls that's got major power and there's so many uh, resources other than oil in the Middle East, it's tremendous. You know, what? what is there? Huge deposits of uh, uh, plutonium uh, in Iraq, if I'm not incorrect. Um, and they are using lies and deceptions like 9-11 to, to send American men and women over there to, to, to terrorize and murder people in their own homes. Uh, so that they, they can take control of these lands. It's just sickening. All of it. So what they say is that it goes from, uh, that it would go from the Nile um, up here to the Euphrates. So I don't know what they do with this huge strip of land uh, here where there's no Euphrates River. <laughs> Maybe they, they arbitrarily pick a spot, right? And... Uh, fill it in I guess <laughs> so, and, and okay so here the exodus map is up too so what I'll do is I'll jump real quick to the first boundaries verse that we get on it and it's uh, it's Genesis 15 18 I, I'm not gonna go to them I have this all in a printout it'll be easier as faster if I read it from the printout and then you can check it for sure please do so Genesis 15 18 it says in the same day that Yahweh made a covenant with Abram saying unto your seed have I given this land from the Nair Mitzrim unto the and in English it says great river the river Euphrates but it's actually it's Nair Gadol Nair Parath and Parath Nair Parath is called Nair Gadol a lot of times Gadol means great like one of the seas, one of the yam that borders the land of promise is actually called Yam Gadul, great. Um, this is a great nair. And from all the evidence I've seen, a nair is a nahal. Remember, because nahal is the broadest term. But what I would say is that a nair would be like large rivers that we think of, whether it be um, the Nile, could qualify as an air. The um, Mississippi could qualify as an air. Um, the Colorado River, the, um, I'm sorry, the Amazon, the Congo. And, and those are, those are examples of huge rivers. Um, but you don't have to be that huge to be an air. Okay, a good sized river. A river that you would need quite a bridge to pass over is what I would consider a nair to be. Um, anybody who finds any different, let me know. So the funny thing about this passage is, first off, if, if this nair mitzram was supposed to be the Nile in Egypt, why is it, in comparison, the Parath, which they say is the Euphrates, is called the nair Gadul? Why wouldn't if the Nair Mitzram was the Nile, why wouldn't it be called the Nair Gadul? Because if you're comparing the Nile to the Euphrates today, um, the Euphrates doesn't come close to being greater than the Nile in any possible way. So, you know, just reason 
would lead you to believe that there's, there's, there's no way if those two things are used in the same expression that Euphrates is going to be called Gadul or Great and the Nile is not. That's insanity. That's insanity. So now there's only, there's only one time, and that's in Genesis 15, 18, that this, um, this river of Mitzram is referred to as a Nair. Any other time, it's going to be referred to as a Nahal, um, or by its name, <coughs> excuse me, which would be Shur. Now, I back up a little bit. Now, how do I know for sure that when the borders are talked about and Yahweh says Nahal Mitzram or Ner Mitzram, how do I know for sure he's not talking about the Nile? And I just want to nail this home because, I mean, of course, I don't think it happened over here. But how do I know for sure? There's interesting passage, two of them, in Deuteronomy, okay? The first one is in Deuteronomy 32.52. And this is Yahweh speaking to Moshe, Moses. Yet, you shall, uh, you shall see the land before you but you shall not go there into the land which I give to the children of Yisrael. Again, he said, you will see the land. I'll show it to you. But you are not going to enter into that land. And this is because of an altercation that happened at Kadesh or Kadesh Barno. Kadesh, Kadesh Barno, it has about five different names, but that's where it happened. And it was called like the waters of Meribah or strife, where he was told to speak to this rock that water was proceeding from. And he did not. He struck it. So again, in Deuteronomy 34, starting in uh, verse 1, it says, And Masha went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountains of, mountain of Nabu to the top of Pisgah that is over against Yerhu, or Jericho. And Yahweh showed him all the land of Galod unto Dan. Now that's on a, diff that's on a different side of Yarden, folks. And all Naphtali, and all the land of Aparim, and Minashe, and all the land of Yehuda, unto the utmost sea, and the Negebe, which they say south, and the plain of the valley of Yerhu, that's not the same as Nahal, uh, the city of, they say the city of palm trees, again, types of trees, types of animals, all very suspect. Anyways, unto Tsoar. And then Yahweh said to him, This is the land which I swear unto Abram, unto Yitzhak, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto your seed. I have caused you to see it with your eyes. But you shall not go over there. This is the land I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Keep in mind, Genesis 15, 18, In the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land. From where? From Ner Mitzram unto Ner Gadul, Ner Parath. Yahweh just told Masha, You may see the land with your eyes that I have given them, but you cannot enter it. So if the promise, based on the Greater Israel Project, was from the Nile up here to the Parath, down here, and dude, they cut it down like halfway down <laughs> the Red Sea itself into Saudi Arabia. And all of this land, all of this land, man, 
then Masha Moses was in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the whole time. Now, anybody who wants to, to do like semantical backflips and say, no, 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 no. It only matters. It only matters. It only matters where the Jordan is. It only matters where the Jordan is because that's where they entered. So it only matters there because that's where they entered. You're just fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. You're playing games. Because 38 years before this, they were to enter the land from that same place where Masha struck the rock, Kadesh, also called Kadesh Barano. They were to have entered the land from there, and they didn't. So there wasn't a magic spot. That was not the magic spot. They could have went into the land from Kadesh. And I'm here to tell you that Kadesh is not in the land proper either. Because wherever Masha went in the Exodus, he could not be within the boundaries promised. Or else he had already been in the land. Do you see where that's a problem? Now, another problem. Now, we have actually a lot of verses from Numbers 34, which actually describes the entire border. And it's uh, pretty cool. It's, there's a lot to this. I could spend a lot of time on just this. Um, but I won't. This actually in, in Numbers 34, 5 is again where this, where this river we're talking about. And it's a border river. And remember, you're going to see, you are going to see that most borders spoken of in this land um, are made by rivers. Not every river is a border, but many, many, many borders are cut by rivers. We see that to this day. I, look in America. Look at the borders in America. Look at the, there's a border between <clears throat> there's a border between America and Mexico. It's a very long border called the Rio Grande. Um, there's borders between the U.S. and Canada, and they mostly consist of Great Lakes and 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 rivers. And there's a St. Lawrence Seaway and everything. These are waters serve as borders. Waters serve as borders. Um, but what I'm thinking of, particularly, I hope I didn't get these <laughs> out, of, um, out of whack. Let's see. That reference was right in front of me and I skipped it. Typical, totally typical of me. It's in um, Exodus 23.31. So even before 34 where I was telling you that the most detailed descriptions of the border that was promised to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob is in um, Numbers 34, verse 3 through, yeah, it's verse 3 through verse 12. And get your obery thinking cap on when you read it because there's a lot of language fooling around there. Exodus 23:31, Yahweh says, I will set thy bounds from Yamsup unto Yam Palshathim, and from the Midbar to the Nair. So what's what's Yam Sup? What's Yam Sup? Now here's the thing: they try to say they try to say that the the Philistines, those horrible Philistines, that they lived. And, and the reason I say that is because they equate the Palestinians of today with the F Philistines of, of yesterday as if, uh, as if the Jews were somehow the good guys and uh, the Palestinians were the bad. But they've turned it into that, man. By owning the media and with all their propaganda. Uh, I'll, I, I digress. So, well, look, let's even say that, let's say that the, uh, 
the Pelshathim even wanted to occupy all of this land in here. And if you look at like really old maps, what they try to do, and this one doesn't actually even get it as good as some others. What, what they'll try to do is show you these, they'll try to show you these wadi veins in what's called Sinai Peninsula. They'll try to show you these wadi veins that goes to this uh, Wadi El Anish. And they say, they say that's the river of Egypt right there. But that does not make much of a border. A. Um, and B, if that is in fact the border they're talking about, then again, Masha Moses was within the promised land, the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can't get around that. Either he was in it, and what we see is a contradiction in Deuteronomy 32 and 34. Like, oh, well, you were in it, but the rest of it. No, they were supposed to go in it within only not even two years in the Midbar. Not even two years in the Midbar they were supposed to go in it from um, Kadesh, Kadesh Berno. Also, the uh, which is within the Midbar Parn, which is uh, relatively within the Midbar Tzan. <laughs> Uh, and it also has another name that is a, a name of a spring. It's also called the Mount of the Amory. And I'll show this when we get there. That's the, the place has a lot of names. And I'm here to tell you that that even was not within the boundaries described. Now, we'll actually see the boundaries of the Shur. Um, also, Nahal Mitzrim. And it has to be... I, and I know we're looking at a map of the Middle East here, and, and that's one of the worst things because it really throws you off. And I didn't bring up my paint program. So let, let's just think of it like this. Um, I'm just going to put verses on the screen. Close your eyes, I guess. You don't have to, but think of it in this way. There has to be this... Nahal, as the border. Now in Genesis 15, 18, it is called a nair, but a nair is a nahal. And we know that this nair is also the nahal being spoken of because we're going to see it over and over and over again as the same place. And we know that this nahal, which specified as a nair, is the Shahur, that's a river, because we'll see it again and again, and we will see places near it. We will understand um, its bounds, and we will absolutely see that that is the border. Because on the other side of it, as we'll see, it faces Mitzrim. The other side of that river is Mitzrim. So if Masha was not to enter any of these places, then you do the math. Then every single place in the Exodus was not within the boundaries of what was promised. True, after time they did expand, they pushed outward. But their expansion was a different thing that was not part of specifically what was promised to them. But a lot of these things, expansion details, how close or how far the parath, which they always translate as Euphrates, ought to be, we're going to have to discuss that too. Because there are a lot of things that don't seem to be directly related to the Exodus that are, and we have to know about them. Like, for instance, the city of, of Mitzram that uh, Peroa and, and Yusuf Joseph were in that was near Gashan. Gashan's another interesting one. This is going to be a place that obviously... Um, 
runs both sides of this Nahal Mitzram or the river of Mitzram. So there's a lot to look at. And we nearly have not even begun, but we have to establish some boundaries. As far as how soon um, I will pick this up, I'm not sure because one thing I found that I have to do amongst many other things that I have to do, which have to do with the shahur or the boundary nahal between um, a portion of Yuda and the Palshathim and the Mitzrim. And that, that takes a lot. Because, as I've said before, this, this was all written in a certain way on purpose. None of this was an accident. I actually have to look at some details on the seas, the yam, the, specifically the ones uh, that border. Because, like I just mentioned, in that passage uh, of Exodus twenty-three thirty-one, I'll set your bounds from... And uh, the, what they translate, it's like every translation, man, in English, uh, they say, from the Red Sea unto the Sea of the Philistines. So interesting. If it was if if he said I'm going to set your border from to the sea of the Philistines. So what that they're going to say then probably what the Gulf of Aqaba to to what to here? You see the the, the Palsha theme they did not occupy all of the uh Yam Gadol. Um other people's did. The Kanoni occupied a, a great deal of it up to um, um, Sidon. So, there's some weird borders, man. Now, they mean the Gulf of Suez is the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines. I'm not sure, but one thing that you're going to see as we go through their journey is that only one arm works in one way and then only one arm works in another way you see it's very difficult and there's excuses and I will be going over those excuses or reasons that they'll say that these things work because hey maybe they're really good concrete solid reasons and every time we get to areas or reasons which seem like it would make this work, I'll tell you about it. But as for now, unless Masha entered the land of promise and somehow we've entirely misunderstood everything we see in Deuteronomy 32 and Deuteronomy 34, and I don't see how that's even possible, he could not have set foot in the land promised to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, which means that there's no way Yahweh promised to them from the Nile to the Euphrates because everywhere Moses' step foot was between the Nile and the Euphrates. They'd be better off saying the defunct Wadi here in... Um, the so-called Sinai Peninsula. I might as well just call it the Sinai Peninsula. That's what they've named it. They'd be better off that way. Problem being is that he still stepped foot in all of that. I think that we're looking for, if anything, we're looking for a river that probably has a more east, east to west. Maybe not totally. But the thing is, it would have to be a river, it, if it took place here, if it took place here in the Middle East, it would have to be a river that kept itself up pretty far so they could come up to this spot, Kadesh or Kadesh Berno, and a few other spots that are actually near it because they spent 19 locations in the wilderness of or Midbar Parn. Um, and so there's no way that even this defunct wadi could be the um, river of Mitzrim or Nahal Mitzrim or Ner Mitzrim. There's just no way. 
Because again, they would be within the boundaries then described, right? From Ner Mitzram to <laughs> Ner Gadul. Okay. So that's the um, that's the overview. We know that for this all to work and those passages to be true, every spot that they're stopping is going to have to be outside of the bounds, the borders promised Abram, Isaac, and Jacob concerning where they would inherit. So until next time, I hope everybody's really well.